I will present you some, some work I've uh, been doing for the past few years. Uh, it's about uh, game simulation and game simulation framework in general that came out of it. And I'll cover a bit um, how it came to be, how it actually works a bit under the hood. I don't have much time now. As one professor of mine said, like, give me at least give me five minutes to present something or at least an hour, so I'll just skim this. And I'll also show you what we used it for in a few examples. And then you can go drink coffee. Um, so uh, as, uh, as uh, presenter mentioned, I come from gaming industry, from Nordius, which is actually close here in Novi Belgrad. And if you're hearing that name for the first time, I really encourage you to look it up you find some very interesting stories about the company, how it was founded, and about things we do, like the thing I'm going to, to present here tonight. So I started in, in Nordius in 2012, and, and that image is pretty representative of how I see myself from this perspective. So if you're thinking uh, you're not good enough to go into data science, and, and there's still a lot you don't know, um, you will learn. <laughs> um, and it's interesting that maybe this is not good representation of the field at that time. Maybe it wasn't in its infancy, but, but maybe teens. Um, anyway, I really had this luck to go into, into the data science when the whole field was uh, rapidly growing and the tools in the field uh, have become more sophisticated. Before, it was uh, mostly Hadoop, which was operated only by people who were these mystical gurus of, of Hadoop, and you can do anything without them. And in the beginning, I, I worked on data infrastructure because it was very important. We needed to actually know what's going on. Uh, so data infrastructure and business intelligence were our prime, prime focuses. I later on worked on our internal BI tool, uh, which works awesome. We, we actually replaced Tableau with it and solved us many, many problems we had. And I had this luck to work on Top 11, which is a huge live game. Uh, it's collecting about a billion events a day right now. And I've been doing um, all kinds of data science things on, on that data, like um, exploratory analysis, uh, machine learning, also a bit of forecasting, and of course, A-B tests, like usual stuff. And again, looking from this perspective, I figured out that um, this is how we actually treated our data, like coming from this mystical black box that we know nothing about, and we're trying to poke it and prod it to, to actually figure out anything. And that might sound weird because we are actually uh, making this game. We should know something about it. But when you uh, include people in that, things get fuzzy. And we all had actually our theories about what people uh, want from the game, how they're interacting with it. We all had our hypotheses. But actually, when you, when you look at the tools that, that we are using, this kind of becomes evident. <clears throat> After that, I went to work on Spell Souls, which was a game in development. It was sort of an experiment. So let's, let's see uh, what data scientists can contribute to game development when there's zero data coming from players. And initially, the idea was to set up all the analytical processes, all the tracking, uh, to have everything ready so we can uh, do as much as possible when, when the game goes live. But on this project, at, at one moment, a um, lead game designer came to me and asked me, how well do you know Excel? And it was a bit weird question for me, so I, I started talking with him what actually he needs with Excel. And it turns out he wanted to build a simulation of the entire virtual economy of the game. So, okay, let's, let's not do that in Excel, but it turns out that Game designers usually use Excel for this, and they are simulating it uh, in a way that it gives you the sense of how some average player will, will have, uh, how the journey of an average player will look like in the game. 
And up to that point, uh, I learned one thing, and that is uh, you can't trust actually averages because uh, our intuition about averages is usually about, um, about Gaussian distributions, about normal distributions, and I have seen zero of them in all the data we have. So uh, my first design decision was to, to simulate population and not an average. And I really like this, this video here. I think, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that the average fish gets eaten here and all these details get lost. <clears throat> I ended up with um, this top-down and bottom-up approach, um, th this architecture. And the idea is to have um, uh, these um, cohort uh, metrics that we are using to define scenario for the simulation. So it's retention, it's average number of sessions and, and average playtime. And um, these, these are kind of cornerstones of, of the um, simulation, of the scenario. And then the idea is to generate individual users in the simulation in such a way that they satisfy these high-level high level statistics. And then they interact with the game, um, they kind of play it, and the simulation is actually logging everything, or if you, if you want, it's tracking everything as real uh, live game would. So you end up with a bunch of data. And very important thing here is that it's not enough to just generate a bunch of users that, that satisfy these high-level statistics. You need to generate them in such a way that they have more or less consistent behavior. So um, intuition says that we need to have like very engaged players and also those who are not engaged and, and everything in between. And if I pick one user from this simulation and see his behavior data, I, I will see some sessions that should look plausible. And uh, this is achieved by attributing each user when it's generated with some random num number, which is in this case like engagement parameter whatever. It's, it's very abstract. And, and let's represent it like this because it's easier to read. And here the green is more engaged. I hope you see the image well. <clears throat> so for instance, if I want to generate sessions for, for these people, I would sample from a given distribution. In this case, it's, it's negative binomial distribution with an average of 4.5. And you get samples like this, 100 samples. And here you already see what I said. Uh, you can't really trust averages. Um, average is, is 4.5, but the dominant samples are 1 and 2. And again, here our intuition says very engaged players should get these, these huge numbers on, on I mean, high numbers on, on the right, and our low engaged players should get this one session or two or something like that. And this is what exactly happens in, in the simulation. <clears throat> so similarly, for retention, we have similar process here. And retention is if, if different industries are, are defining it differently. Uh, in gaming, um, it's percent of people who will be active on a certain day from a cohort where cohort is all users who have registered on one given day. And here I, I couldn't represent everything because uh, it would just create visual clutter, but here's for some key points on a typical retention curve. And what you can see here is that you're quickly losing people who are um, least engaged, the red ones on the left, and as you go right, as time passes, you actually end up with more and more engaged people, which is, again, very intuitive. Engaged people stay longer, they play more often. And yeah, this is very important because I will go back to, to this fact. It's kind of sometimes easy, easy to forget about, about very simple facts like this. So now we have their uh, airtime, so to speak, 
we know when they will play, how long. Uh, we need to decide what are, they, what are they going to do with that time in, in, in the game. And in mobile gaming, there's this concept of core loop, which is this set of actions that you're repeating when, when you're playing the game. And a um, very important fact is that actually games um, kind of limit you at how much you can play, which is probably good for some people. Um, <laughs> And this can be achieved through, through, a, metric, uh, through, through a mechanic uh, of um, uh, energy system, for instance, where you simply deplete energy if you're doing uh, battles or you're solving puzzles or whatever other core activities in the game. Some games are using more um, soft boundaries where past some point they will just reward less and less for doing this core, core activity. And this actually helps a lot in, in determining how people will behave in the game. But it, it's still not straightforward because with this whole concept of core loop comes this virtual economy. We started this, this story from. And these virtual economies can be relatively complex. And these two gentlemen actually uh, thought a lot about how people decide in, in these circumstances, and this might help you recognize one of them. The other one still hasn't gotten his, his blockbuster movie. So both of them got Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, neither is actually an economist. Uh, Daniel Kahneman is a psychologist who's famous uh, for the book Thinking Fast and Slow, and he's all about human biases and errors we make when we make decisions. And John Nash gave us this beautiful mathematical tools to describe behavior of so-called rational agents. And in my opinion, when, when you think about how people are going to behave, how they'll interact with, with your product, whatever it is, uh, you need both of these perspectives. And from my experience, I think uh, we often forget actually the rational part. Uh, that, that was very important for, for my work. So when it all comes together, we start from, from these activity metrics. We define, uh, we generate individual users who have now very consistent behavior. Uh, they interact with the game. Uh, they, they have some simple, and, and here's the actually a bit of dark art in, in this whole story. You need to define a simple way to describe how people will actually make these decisions in, in virtual economies. Um, it's the hardest part, but the uh, good thing is that you don't have to be as precise. This is still useful even if you're uh, more or less wrong. So in the end, as I said, you get all this wonderful data and I'm usually using actually Tableau to, to look at it and analyze it the same way I would uh, live, live date. And here's a few examples how it's actually used and what we got out of it. So the games have um, this uh, concept, this mechanic uh, of reward boxes they, they will give you. And you can't actually open them immediately. You need to return in like three hours or five hours or something like that. And if you're into game development, you can search the internet and find analysis about how is this great mechanic because it strengthens the bond between players and the game because it schedules their next session, etc., etc. So we also had this mechanic and we wanted to know how well it actually works. But when you start analyzing it, it, it is actually very hard because you can figure out some, some metrics, uh, you draw some distributions when people return to the game, uh, how much they're late for that appointment, etc., etc. But these are just numbers. They don't tell anything. And then you need to decide some things which are very vague. And in ideal world, we would have people who are completely unaffected with this and then compare the data of everyone, everybody else with their data and then know the difference 
this will make in their behavior, but we don't have that. Actually, with this simulation, um, I know that these people in simulation aren't affected with this. They're randomly logging into the game, or if you want to put it like that, they're playing when they want and how long they want. And then if you measure how many chests are open in simulation and how many are open in, in live game, it turns out the numbers are almost identical. So this is very, very important use case for, for this simulation. It establishes baseline for metrics that are usually very specific and very abstract and uh, uh, related to, to specific game. Um, and now when you get some, some real numbers, it's easier to figure out uh, what they mean. Without baseline, it's just numbers. So yeah, it turns out that people aren't actually affected with this because I, I know many people who are late for even more important things than virtual equivalent of like two cents. And people aren't robots actually. So even though you know some stories about people who, who get lost in the games, those are mostly exceptions. <clears throat> Another good example and this one goes back actually to the title, is uh, pair retention. In um, mobile games, which are free to play economy, uh, people who pay are minority and they're very, very important. So important that they get their own metrics. And from the whole theory of data warehousing, this is a bit ill-defined metric. Uh, but still, everyone are using this. And they obviously, obviously have much better engagement than everybody else. And the standard explanation is, well, they paid for the game, so they're more involved with it because they paid. But when you think about it a bit deeper, you, you intuitively sense that, okay, well, people who are more interested in the game in the first place will be more likely to pay, but then you get this classic egg and chicken problem. And, and I, I was really curious about um, what comes first here and uh, which part has, has the biggest influence on their behavior. But usually you can't do that because we're stuck with, with correlations and it's really, really hard to do any causal inference. And then I used thought experiment, which is age-old tool in, in science and can be used in data science as well. And the thought experiment goes like this. Let's imagine that people can't actually pay for the game. Instead, we will silently flag some of them about the same number each day and they will get nothing. They will be just flagged in the system and the first time they're flagged, they're payers. So, um, the point is that they don't have anything about, from it, they, they don't know about it, and it certainly can't influence their, their behavior. So the first part is, um, is removed from, from the cyclical problem. And then the question is, uh, okay, how does their retention look like? And because I, I mentioned random sampling here, you probably think, okay, well, it's, it's just kind of a, a test and they will have the same metric. But the very important fact is that in order for someone to pay, they need to be active. And, and we're actually sampling active people here. And if you go back mentally, because I won't go back to that slide, uh, to, the, to the slide uh, with retention, you remember that we get uh, more and more engaged people every day, not get, they, more and more engaged people stay, actually. Uh, so you will end up with this. So these payers who don't know about it still have huge retention, much better. And that's because of selection bias and not because of their behavioral bias. It's, it's not psychological, it's about system, it's about how we measure things, 
and, and how, how data is actually produced. And you can do this uh, experiment even on real data. You can, you can take real, real uh, people data and do this silent labeling and get uh, something like this. And I did it, and with it, uh, I got enough information to actually build this whole uh, model in, into, into simulation. So all this you're seeing, this is the difference between real pairs, so to speak, and, and those who are just falsely, who are just flagged. Um, this is generated with, with this model. It looks very realistic for, for those who actually saw anything uh, similar. Um, so obviously, real pairs are kind of correlated. So their their uh, behavior, paying behavior, is is obviously correlated with their engagement. But even that is is heavily biased because of the whole process. And cool thing about this is because it's not a black box model, it's, it's now a very intuitive model with uh, intuitive uh, knobs that you can touch and play with it and, and uh, prod, I can start, start inferring the causal relation between uh, engagement and payment and then payment and engagement. And this is, in my opinion, a huge step up compared to traditional, traditional methods. Other benefits of this simulation are simply um, related to, to game development and aren't maybe interesting to, to all of you, but uh, this actually uh, made cooperation between data scientists and game designer much deeper. Uh, we started uh, working together in defining this behavior of people and now they can uh, actually get the results of their assumptions on behavior and, and figure out some, some things even before this game goes live. We don't need to wait for weeks or months to get some data from, from real people because some obvious mistakes can, can be actually seen even in this sort of fake data. And uh, that's, that's about it. Thank you, Marco, for this rather interesting talk. As always, we have some questions from the audience. So the first question we have is, do you think that pre-processing of the data could somehow change this, the distribution of it, and thus leading to misleading insights? Pre-processing of data. Um, yeah, well, whatever you do with data, you can unconsciously introduce some biases in it. Um, and as I showed in this case, even just the process that is generating data can, can introduce biases. So uh, I've often seen people who look, into, who look at, at some distributions and then they see something interesting in it. But um, it's very important to know where the data is coming from, and I'm not just talking about the data warehouse pipeline. I'm talking about like the whole system, um, because as I mentioned, without solid baseline, you can't actually figure out those those things from from some from just one distribution. Cool. Uh, moving on. Can you use simulated population to predict, in a sense, how a change in the game would affect the real user? And if yes, how? Uh, yes, in a limited manner. Uh, so, as I said, uh, we often forget that people are actually very rational. So, uh, things we engage in might seem irrational, like playing games to someone, um, or falling in love with someone, but once we got into something, we're, we're really optimizing some things. Um, so people are actually more or less optimally behaving in games. If you take into consideration their lives that exist outside of it and, and everything. Um, so 
Yeah, for instance, um, even before the game is launched, uh, we can have assumptions about how long people are going to play the game. So for instance, uh, let's say it's an hour a day. Um, with this, we can calculate uh, how much this virtual reward will they accumulate on average with, with hour of gameplay. But uh, if we test that with, let's say, 20 minutes of gameplay, and it, figure, it, it turns out that it's just about 10% less reward than what they'd get, it's kind of uh, sensible that they will actually play something closer to 20 minutes and, and not one hour. Uh, similarly, sometimes we can infer some, some changes in behavior from, from changes in system. Thank you. And what tools did you use to make the population simulation? What tools? Tools, yes. Uh, oh, um, I wrote everything in Python first, uh, but then it was rather slow because it's literally simulating every second of, of their gameplay, so to speak, uh, for, let's say, thousands and thousands of, of users. Um, so we tried to optimize Python a bit, but I was a great fan of Julia since I heard for it first time, so I rewrote everything in Julia, and it worked, I think, 10 times faster immediately. Uh, so it's stuck in, in, in Julia. It works awesome. And um, did the results of the sim simulation actually compare to actual data? Yes, so uh, not for everything. Uh, usually we can, we can look into these um, relative changes more easily, but uh, for some things, like the example for chests, uh, we can literally get almost one-on-one -on -one, uh, replication of, of uh, real data if we use activity from the production as, as input parameters for the simulation. Going on a bit of a different tangent here, uh, why did you replace Tableau? Oh, um, well, uh, mostly because it was starting to get really cluttered. And the other thing was we were very hands-on with data. We wanted to, to create this um, data culture in our company so everyone can, can you know, get into it. Um, and then this created really hard problem for, for us as engineers. So... Um, Everything needs to work fast, like they need to get all the graphs in seconds, uh, but they want almost unlim unlimited depth in, in you know, um, slicing and dicing the data. And you can't get that in, in Tableau. Uh, you can get either one or the other one, and everything is getting, as I said, cluttered over time. So we built this tool where uh, like all the KPIs are, are defined in a single place, they are available to everyone, and with some tricks in, in the backgrounds, we, we got both. So they have unlimited uh, ability to slice and dice, and everything is, is served in like a few seconds, on average. <laughs> ah, those averages. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're all here. Um, Going back to, you said you switched from Python to Julia. So how long did it take you to create the simulation in Julia? So it took me about a month uh, to, to make it in Python. And then I rewrote it in Julia in, I think, uh, three days. And then I rewrote it as this framework, which can be used generally for, for other games in like two days. So uh, the hardest part is, is to figure out everything. It's easy to program. Uh, going on the more business side of things, let's say, uh, do you think that in order to generate more revenue, it's more important to get payers to pay more or for non-payers to get to the payers level? Or for non-payers to... To actually start paying, so... <laughs> oh, um, well, it's... Be careful here. <laughs> yeah, um, so it, it's a very complex question, and it's um, about business decision, basically. I know about game studios which uh, hope, uh, focus heavily on, on paying users, 
um, and they just disregard everything else. But uh, this model I've created um, shows this very complex relation between uh, between um, retention and, and conversion curve and everything else. Um, so, in a way, you are paying this good retention of pairs by uh, not converting some of the pairs. And it's cool because we kind of figure out with, with this model uh, where we are, how, how many of them are we losing, what um, what potential revenue are we losing? In my opinion, I think uh, it's important to make good game, and if it's good, people will play it. They will be delighted and and pay for it. So that's always the best thing. Okay, and I have an interesting one for you to wrap things off. Uh, what is the weirdest insight you got from top eleven user data? <laughs> Sorry, what is? <laughs> what is the weirdest insight? you got from top 11 user data? Okay. Um, so, um, Too many to on, a, on a side note, on a side note, uh, we got two people from Vatican playing. Um, <laughs> that, people that, say they don't that have, was they really don't cool fun. to see. And the other thing which, which kind of sparked uh, part of, of this I, I presented here is that uh, people who actually pay a lot, um, they aren't irrational as, as it's often uh, portrayed. So uh, in the sense of, of game as a system with, uh, they're, they're interacting with, uh, they're actually very, very optimal. They're playing that and they're spending their money much more optimally than everyone else, than people who just casually play and spend just a bit of money. So I kind of see them as people who, who have this um, uh, hobby they're really engaged into, or, or even professional athletes that really give in to something. Uh, that was, for me, maybe the most interesting insight I got. Thank you. Um... With that insight and the Vatican playing footballers, I think this is a good... <laughs> Italians. <laughs> Italians, exactly. They didn't do that. Uh, I think this is a good time to conclude this topic. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Thank you. And on behalf of the conference, I would also like to give you this certificate of appreciation.